Your organic chemistry professor expects that you remember everything you learned in general chemistry, but I'm guessing you don't. And so in this Leia for Sci video, we'll do a quick review of general chemistry topics that you need for organic chemistry, starting with the atom. In the center of your atom, you have a nucleus, and in that nucleus, you have protons with a positive charge that I'll show as a plus, and we also have neutrons with a neutral or no charge, which together combine to give us the mass of the atom, where both the proton and neutron are each one atomic mass unit. Outside of the nucleus, we have electrons, which are negative, floating around not randomly, but rather in specific shells and orbitals. Electrons have such a tiny mass compared to a proton and neutron that for the sake of this discussion, we'll assume it's approximately zero atomic mass units. Organic chemistry is based around the element carbon, which you'll notice has the number six for the atomic number telling us that it has six protons and a charge of plus six in the nucleus, a mass of approximately 12 AMU, for six protons and six neutrons. And because the atom is neutral, we assume that electrons equals protons for a total of six electrons. Electron location is not random. Instead, they exist in specific orbitals, which in general chemistry you learned S, P, D, and F. Luckily, in organic chemistry, we're only looking at the S and P orbital. Since electrons live in the different shells, only the outermost or valence electrons are available to interact with other atoms, and only those electrons are going to participate in organic chemistry reactions. Those valence electrons are located in the S and P orbitals. If you're excited to drop the rest, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and let's continue. No discussion on atoms is complete without a look at the periodic table. Let's review only what you need to know. This block here is our S block for the S orbital. Here we have our P block, our D block, and F. The important groups on the periodic table are one and two for our metals, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight for the nonmetals. This also tells us the number of valence electrons, which is how you will know that sodium has one valence electron, carbon has four, and the halogens have seven. The table also shows you some trends. The two trends to remember are that electronegativity increases up and towards the right, and size increases down and towards the left. This tells me that fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine, while iodine is larger than bromine. While you should get a periodic table on your orgo exams, I highly recommend memorizing the following 10 atoms. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Use my active writing approach to memorize it so that you can easily write hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, sulfur, and phosphorus. Remembering that this is one, four, five, six, seven. Electronegativity up towards the right and size down to the left. Atoms have a specific arrangement of electrons, and in my electron configuration video linked below at layerforsci.com slash intro orgo, I show you a periodic table trick where you can easily tell the electron configuration for chlorine by doing this. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. Back to the atom. Even though they start with different numbers of valence electrons, they still want to follow the octet rule to have a complete shell of eight electrons. A few notable exceptions include hydrogen, which is okay with just two, boron, just three, and larger atoms like sulfur, phosphorus, chlorine, bromine can have more than eight, such as 10 or even 12, which I'll show you when we look at Lewis structure. Bonding is how they achieve that octet. A covalent bond is when atoms share electrons, and we have two types. A polar bond is when they're pretending to share, but one of the atoms is hogging the electrons, such as what you'll see between oxygen and hydrogen in water. When oxygen is hogging the electrons and pulling them towards itself, it becomes slightly more negative, making hydrogen slightly more positive, giving us a dipole, meaning a partially negative end on oxygen and partially positive end on hydrogen. A nonpolar bond is when the atoms are sharing the electrons equally, such as methane, which has a bond between carbon and hydrogen, very close in electronegativity, and they're each holding the electrons equally. Of course, when the atoms no longer want to share, you have an ionic bond, which is the attraction of opposite charges. 
You'll see this often in organic chemistry where a spectator ion like sodium or potassium will be attracted to something negative like an oxygen, in this case hydroxide. When the positive and negative attract, you get that ionic bond so that this compound is written out as NaOH pretending to be neutral when in reality it's Na plus and OH minus. Most of the organic molecules you study will have covalent bonds. And since bound atoms make molecules, we have to know how to draw the molecules. Lewis structure is when you simply draw the atom, draw the electrons, and put bonds between them. For example, methane, we have carbon and four hydrogens. Each hydrogen has its one valence electron. Carbon had four valence electrons, and that allows us to form a bond between carbon and each hydrogen atom. But organic molecules are not flat, they're three-dimensional, and this comes from understanding how the hybrid orbitals work together. Hybridization is a tricky topic, and I do cover this in detail in the series link below or on my website, layerforsci.com slash intro orgo. But as an overview, we said that the organic molecules have their valence shell in the S and the P orbital, where specifically we have one S orbital and three P orbitals. As you can see here, if every orbital holds two electrons, we have one pair of S electrons and three pairs of P to give us PX, PY, and PZ. The hybridization comes from mixing them together in different quantities and all you do is count what you see. If I mix 1s plus 3p, giving me s times p times p times p, for sp to the third or sp3. If I mix just 1s and 2p, I get sp2, allowing for double bonds or carbocations. And if I mix just s and p to get an sp orbital, I now have room for a triple bond or two double bonds. In my hybridization video, I teach you that when a molecule has four groups around it, such as methane, you simply count 1, 2, 3, 4, S, P1, P2, P3. But this also works for water, which has 1, 2, and yes, 3, 4 groups around it. If a molecule only has three groups around it, such as BH3, you count 1, 2, 3, S, P1, P2, or even the oxygen in acetone or propanone has 1, two, three. And finally, if I look at the carbon in carbon dioxide, I have one, two, one, two, for an sp hybrid. If you want to describe the structure, an sp3 hybrid is a tetrahedron or tetrahedral with a bond angle of approximately 109.5. So that methane molecule we kept drawing flat is better off being drawn like this, where these two bonds are in the plane of the page, they sit flat on the screen. The dashes are going back into the page, into the screen, and this wedge is coming out at you, out of the screen. An sp2 hybrid is trigonal planar, or 120 degrees, such as our acetone molecule. This is approximately 120. And our sp hybrid is linear, with a bond angle of 180 degrees, as you can see with carbon dioxide, where the molecule is drawn on a straight line. Now that you've refreshed the basics, here's my challenge to you. If all of this was just a review, test your knowledge using the free practice quiz on my website linked below at layerforsci.com slash intro orgo. And if you feel you need a more in-depth review for any of the topics discussed today, first, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss out on any new videos. Then see both of my playlists linked below, also on my website at layerforsci.com slash intro orgo.